All right, I'm back. We're on page 300, which is a huge accomplishment, right? 29 pages to go. Well, really 30 because 329 minus 300 is 29, but then you add one, so 30 pages to go. But when we're done with this, 29 pages to go, and that's going to feel pretty good. So uh, this will feel like sort of a diversion from what we've been doing a little bit because we're going to work with some numerical data, which is something you do a lot of because it's really unusual to actually have a function. It's more likely that you uh, have discrete data points and then you kind of approximate them with something and then you do all your calculus stuff on that thing. But we have this concept, average rate of change. Average rate of change is algebra one slope. Every time you hear average rate of change, you should think algebra one slope. Every time you hear algebra one slope, you should think average rate of change. So the average rate of change of a function is just the slope between two points on the function. So it's gonna be delta y over delta x, f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. So that, uh, if, if we were in class, I would be saying that like 50 times until you were really annoyed by it. But average rate of change is algebra one slope. So average rate of change is algebra one slope. Average rate of change, algebra one slope, slope of a secant line. Okay, that's a big deal. Um, and it's, it's actually a surprisingly big deal. It's gonna come up a ton, even though this is like calculus. Instantaneous rate of change which is the rate of change at exactly one point, not on average over an interval, but at one point, that's a calculus concept. And to find that, we actually take the limit of the slope of the secant line, which we've seen several times. Hopefully you've been uh, kind of keeping up with that. So instantaneous rate of change, I always refer to as calc one slope. It's also the slope of the curve. It's the slope of the tangent line, slope of a lot of things. Um, so let's see if we can do this. So probably not enough room on here. Uh, but I'm gonna try to do it anyway. So a car starts from rest at a red light. Uh, the car then drives on a straight road from for 35 seconds. Car's position at select times given in the table below. Time is measured in seconds. Distance is measured in feet. All right. So the first question: Find the average velocity of the car over the 35 second interval. First of all, we're not really told in the table, but um, I'm gonna say that at t equals zero, the position is uh, also equal to zero, right? And then at one, you've gone six feet and then so on. So I'm gonna say that that's true. All right, so average velocity is change in position over time. It's the average rate of change of position. So average velocity is the average rate of change of position. So this is gonna be, um, let's call the position S of T. So I'm gonna say this is S of 35, S of 35, minus s of zero over 35 minus zero, which I'm just gonna use a calculator on this um, for, uh, well, for all the obvious reasons. Nobody wants to do this math by hand. Uh, so that's one, six, eight, seven minus zero divided by 35. So I get 48.2, so 48.2, but 48.2 what? Well, position, is measured in uh, feet, measured in feet. I underline the wrong thing. Time is measured in seconds. So it's gonna be in feet per second. So let's do that. So feet per second. All right, so now let's tighten up the interval and we're just gonna go from 17 to 21, average velocity. So that's gonna be S of 21 minus S of 17 over 21 minus 17. Okay, so that's gonna be, back to the calculator, I'm not gonna make you watch this. Uh, that's 938 minus, uh, wait, nope, what am I doing? S of, S of 21, sorry. Okay, S of 21 is 1213 minus S of 17 is 938 divided by two. That gives me 137.5, that's, in feet per second. So 137.5 feet per second. Maybe I should make you watch uh, the calculator stuff. Um, in fact, let me, let me switch over to just the calculator. You don't have to watch me write it on the notes. Okay, so the next one, 17 to 19. So on the notes, I'm gonna write S of 19 minus S of 17 over 19 minus 17. Okay, so what are we really doing here is we're trying to get a sense of what what's the velocity at t equals 19, right? So the first one we went from 
17 to 21, what's right between those? 19. So we could say that like the average velocity from 17 to 21 is 137.5. So like a good guess of the velocity at 19, I guess would be 137.5 potentially. Um, now we're gonna say, well, from 17 to 19, we'll have an average velocity. So let's see if we can find that. So 1080 minus uh, 938 and divide by uh, two. I think I was supposed to divide by four on the previous one. Let me go back to here, divide this by four, right? Because that was that's way more reasonable. I'm gonna change that on the notes right now. At the end of this video, when I go back to the notes, I'll like show that, but I'm changing this to 68.75. That seems better because this gave me 71 feet per second. Okay, so that's not bad. Average velocity on the interval from 19 to 21. So that's going to be uh, 1, 2, 1, 3. So it's, it's S of 21 minus S of 19 divided by 2 again, uh, which is what got me last time. 1080 divided by 2, 66.5. So let me write that down. Well, maybe I should bounce back and forth. I don't know what's the most interesting. I don't know what's the most boring. Uh, I know it's annoying personally for me to have to switch back and forth, but you can see that I've made the change there. Um, I'm gonna change, so this will be S of 21 minus S of 19. So it's like the first time we didn't use 19 at all. We went one to the left in the table and one to the right and found the slow secant line. That's a very common thing to do. The second time we, we decided to use S of 19 and we went one to the left. And so we just kind of like said, all right, on that interval, what, what would be a good estimate? Now we're gonna go S of 19 and one to the right in the table. These are all really common things to do. Um, and so you kind of have to get used to it because it's kind of weird. Like it's a strange process, um, but it's what we do. So when you're working with data, there aren't like, there are a lot of wrong answers, but like the, the fact that something's a right answer is like by convention. Um, did I already do this? I did do this. This was 66.5. And that was in feet per second. All right. So the next question is um, to say what we think a good estimate of the velocity at 19 would be. So approximate the velocity. Well, from experience, I know that what we typically do is we typically just use the the secant line that goes one to the left, one to the right. So I'm gonna do that um, and say that, so V of 19, the velocity is approximately, uh, I'm gonna use 68.75 feet per second. And I don't really have a better reason than conventionally that's what we do. We typically go one to the left, one to the right. So that's a, good as we can do based on this table, but then there's the obvious question, what would you need to know uh, to better approximate the exact speed of the car at exactly the 19 second mark? So there's two, I think there are two answers to this question. I think the first answer is uh, to better approximate, so to better approximate, we need more data, we need data closer to 19 data closer, closer to 19 seconds, right? Like if we had data for uh, 18.999, so like 18.999 and we had 19.001, if we found the slope of the secant line on that interval, I'd be pretty comfortable saying that at 19, the uh, exact speed or velocity of this car would be approximately that value. Like I'd feel very confident, but as it is, we only have these two second intervals, which is kind of weird to begin with because you start at zero and your first interval is at one. I don't know what I was doing when I made this table, um, but let's look at this next thing. So the function S of T equals this horrific thing, approximate the car's position over time. So this is what I think the second answer would have been. I think that if we had had a function it gives us position, then we know that we can find the instantaneous rate of change of position by finding the slope of position, which will give us the velocity. So there's this relationship, you have position, the derivative of position is velocity, 
if you're in physics, the derivative of velocity is acceleration. So these are all like really common words that you may already know. Um, so the function s of t, use the function to find the car's instantaneous flow. Okay, so I'm gonna say that v of, ah, okay. I'm gonna say, sorry, I'm just zooming like crazy here. V of 19 should be equal to s prime of 19. And then uh, let's let a calculator do that. So uh, we're gonna switch, chair, switch, here we go. All right, so I'm gonna put in the function. So I'm gonna call it s of t. So it's 0 0.00139 t to the fourth, okay? Minus 0 0.17593 t cubed. I bet a lot of these decimals don't really make a significant difference. 5.83333 and then t squared. Okay, let's see what the velocity is. So I need to find the derivative with respect to t of s of t. And then I wanna do it when t is equal to 19. And it's gonna give me a decimal because there are a lot of decimals everywhere. It's 69.270. So I'm gonna go with that, 69.270. Let's chop that down and see what we get. So 69.270. So I'm gonna say 69.270 feet per second. Now, how good was that? So I had guessed 68.75 based on just the secant line. Like it was the best I could do. Um, so I think, I mean, that was like a pretty good guess. I mean, 71, maybe they're, they're both good, right? Uh, 66.5 seems pretty low, but again, it would be a valid guess based on the table that we have because we can't really do much better. What I'm going to do is, uh, and then I'm going to cut this video here. Uh, what if I did what I suggested, right? So my suggestion was if we had S of uh, 19.001 minus S of 18.999 over 19.001 minus 18.999. 69.2704, like that would have been really good. We just didn't have enough data. All right, so I'm gonna stop this here. I'll come back in the next video. And we will keep going with this concept. There's a lot going on. This is like an application problem. You've got data in a table. These are all really common things. You just have to like know how to read the problem, interpret it, and then uh, kind of like implement the plan. So I will see you in the next video where we keep doing that. So see you then.